Hi, I'm Rebecca Jarvis. Welcome to The Startup. And we're joined by Chantelle Waterbury, the founder and CEO of Chloe and Isabel. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so tell me about your company. You are on maternity leave and you start crafting a business plan. Because that's what people do on maternity leave. <laughs> Naturally. I was like, this is the first time in my life I've ever been bored. <laughs> um, you know, Chloe and Isabel was an idea in, in my mind for, for many years. I mean, it was really something that I was probably crafting over 15 years in terms of the brand itself, but in terms of the business model, it really wasn't until um, I was on maternity leave where I could really put pen to paper and start putting it, putting it all together, and I just decided, you know, there's no time like the present. I should just attack this full force, and when I came off of maternity leave, I started putting the steps together to, to launch the business. Why the direct selling model? I turned to direct sales, and that was how. You did? I, yeah, that's how I paid my way through school. Where? So I sold Cutco knives. You sold <laughs> Cutco knives. My high school boyfriend sold Cutco knives. <laughs> I was surrounded by men, I'll tell you that. Really? Yeah, um, I sold $30,000 worth in three months, and I made enough money to pay for my first two years of, of school. And it was amazing. It gave me the confidence to, to really believe that I could do anything. I mean, I remember being 21 and, and walking into a corporate buying office and marching into my CEO's office and be like, you need to give me $15 million because I can give you this turn and this margin. And I just don't think I could have done it had I not had that confidence from running a business at, at 17, 18 years old. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about, about what I did and then it made me start to look at, well, what does that industry look like today? And I was shocked to see that it hadn't really changed or, or innovated at all. And that's kind of where the obsession began. And I thought, well, why don't I take something that I've been doing my entire life and, and actually Sales do and well, yeah, jewelry. jewelry. Yeah, I mean, because really, I mean, I've been in design, design and development of jewelry for, for 15 years. I was doing it for everyone from Macy's to Gap to working with Cartier and, and Van Cleef and Arpel. And I thought, how can I take something that I really know and make a difference in this world and not just make beautiful jewelry? And that's where I got really excited is, okay, well, you know, Chloe and Isabel is so much more than just a fashion jewelry brand. It's actually empowering the next generation of female entrepreneurs and we're a financial opportunity. And that's, that's what inspired me. So what does it cost to get into Chloe and Isabel, to be a direct seller for your business? So we are actually a very different model from what you would see a normal direct selling company. In direct sales, you pay a certain amount of money and you're suddenly selling this product. We actually have somewhat of a lengthy interview process because we're hand selecting every single merchandiser. You select the people who become the direct sellers. Yeah. So they're not just buying a kit and going out and selling it. <laughs> no, I thought that would be much easier, but sometimes I'm like, oh, that would, that would be nice. Why did you <laughs> choose to do that? Everybody has different goals in life and we didn't want to focus on the one person who became a millionaire selling it, but how it can affect every single person. And in order for us to create that program, we needed to have personal relationships with every single seller and, and get an idea of, well, what does success look like and what does she look like? And at the same time, she's an extension of our brand. She is my store. So if, if we're building this, this amazing brand, how do we make sure that she's given all of the tools to represent the brand and make money doing it? One of the things with direct selling where it gets a, a bad name for yeah, itself no, is absolutely. people getting into something and then just having to go to all their friends and family and sort of shove it down their throats. And you probably saw that with, with Cutco a little bit. Yeah. Um, how do you keep it from being like that? And to what degree are people expanding with Chloe and Isabel beyond that personal network? It's not about selling to your, to your friends and family and going to the same people over and over again. It's about teaching them how to do a social media marketing campaign. How, do you, how can we drive business for her? How can she have this more both online and then partnering with local businesses instead of local friends? You know, it's, it's just a completely different business model in how we're teaching her. Where are you getting this jewelry from? Once you've designed it, yeah. you are the one who's designing it and yes. then you're sourcing it out. Yeah, so we design every single piece of jewelry in our, our studio in Tribeca and then we work with factories overseas for actually producing all of it in the top I mean, they produce the top jewelry around the world. So. so primarily Asian factories. Yes, primarily in Asia. And these are the people that I've been working with for years and developing relationships with for years so that I can actually be in these top factories. And I'm sure you do get the question, you know, why not in the United States? Why don't you create your jewelry here in the United States? And what do you say to that? Uh, you know, Unfortunately, I, mean, I wish we could, but most of the factories here have, have closed down. I mean, it used to be when I started in this industry, everything was 
primarily made in, in Providence, Rhode Island. And since then, you've just seen these factories all closed down. So even if I was to try and go there, they're most likely extending their lines into, into Asia as well. Mm. So, it's, so it's not just a matter of price and, and what the consumer and your company pays. It's a matter of there's no supply. Yeah, I don't think that that the, that world doesn't really function here anymore. So those options, but it certainly, as a result, would be a much higher price because we don't even have the the number of skilled workers out there doing that here. I mean, it's really unfortunate. I mean, we're seeing it across so many industries that it's all moving overseas. How do you determine your prices? I think that there's there's two ways that I really look at it. One is definitely the price value relationship. I mean, we people come back to us all the time and they say, "Why aren't you charging more for that?" Because you couldn't mm. possibly get that in a store for that price. Like our number one item is $168 and I sometimes scratch my head like why is that our number one seller when it's our most expensive piece, one of our most expensive pieces in the line and I think it's because they look at it and they're like how is it not $350? What is it? You know, um, it's called the Retro Glam Torsade. <laughs> and what is that? A it's, torsade? A, it's a torsade necklace. Um, okay. It's a really beautiful. I've never heard that term before. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> industry, industry speak. Um, it's, it's just this really beautiful multi-layered sort of twisted chain and pearl and crystal necklace. I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous piece, but you know, that you can look at a piece and say competitively, where should this be priced? Um, or you can look at, well, how much is it actually costing me to produce it? And then marking it up from there. Um, because again, we don't have this extra layer of, of a middleman. I don't mark it up just because it should be that price. I just do whatever the minimum amount that we need to, to give a great price value relationship to our end customer. Fabulous. So, Thanks so much. Thank Tom. you. And thank you for watching us on The Startup. Remember, if there's someone you'd like to see here, tweet us at Rebecca Jarvis, hashtag The Startup.